If you had a chance to live any kind of lifestyle you wanted to and had millions of dollars to do it, how exactly would you live and spend it? I think most people would copy the life of actor Tom Cruise, as you know, is one of the most famous actors on the planet. You know, the guy behind Mission Impossible and Minority Report and Top Gun and The Last Samurai, all those famous movies out there. From all of his movies and investments, it's been said that Tom Cruise is worth around $600 million. Wow, that's a lot of money. And he certainly doesn't hold back on living his best life now. It's been said that he owns multiple homes across the nation, which includes a $30 million mansion in Beverly Hills he bought back in 2006, which has seven bedrooms a pool, and even a kid's playground. And add to that, check this out, a private jet, which costs over $38 million. He has spent tens of thousands of dollars for pilot training courses so that he can fly his own planes and jets. And he also drives a lot of fancy cars, all the Chevys, Porsches, and even motorcycles which costs anywhere from tens of thousands to millions of dollars. Now contrast this life to the life of another man named Eric Liddell. A lot of you don't know him because he was born in the early 1900s. He was called the Flying Scotsman because he was one of the fastest racers on the planet at the time. And his life was actually portrayed in this movie called Chariots of Fire, which came out in the 19. 80s. One of the fastest sprinters, he would go into races and he would win so many races and he became so popular all around the world because of it. But you know what was interesting is that Eric Liddell was a man of great faith, meaning that he was a very strong Christian. He was born to missionary parents and he even kept that faith throughout his whole life. In fact, he, he shocked the entire world when he refused to run the 1924 Paris Olympics, a race that many people favored him to actually win. And he withdrew from it because he said it took place on a Sunday and he didn't want to break the Sabbath. So for a number of years, instead of pursuing all the dreams and all the glamour and the fame that was out there at the time, he served as a missionary in China, which is not the safest place to serve actually. And remember, this was during World War II. So when Japan entered and occupied China, Eric Liddell, the first thing he did was send his wife and kids away back to Canada. But instead of going with them, do you know what he did? He actually stayed in China to help as a missionary. He was captured by the Japanese army and sent to a dirty prison camp where he served several years there or not served, he was imprisoned, but yet he made good use of his life. He was organizing sports events for the children, tutoring them, and even bringing the gospel to them before dying at age 43 of a brain tumor a few months before the war ended. And unfortunately, Liddell never saw his family again, at least not in this life. So the reason that I bring up the story is to ask you the question, who do you think of these two people lived the better life? Of course, if you were to ask any average person on the street, they're going to say, yeah, of course, Tom Cruise lived the better life. That's a no brainer. This Eric Liddell guy is just this religious nut and it was a complete waste of his life and his fame and everything. But then if you ask Christians the same question, they'll say the opposite. They'll say, that of course, Eric Liddell lived the life that he should have lived because at the end of the day, he's gonna be blessed and people like Tom Cruise, they're gonna stand before God on the day of judgment and they're gonna see what a wasted life that they had. Then who exactly is right of these two? The answer to this question really comes down to whether or not Jesus Christ really resurrected from the dead. That's exactly what this passage is about that I'm going to show you today. Because if Jesus Christ never resurrected from the dead, then we have no reason to live this life at all. In fact, what I'm doing up here is a complete waste of time when I could be sleeping in on Sundays. But if Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead, 
then even though your life may be hard as a Christian, you have so much to look forward to in all eternity. And that's what the Apostle Paul talks about in this passage we're going to look at today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 34. So that's where you need to be in your Bibles. So to give you a little context, once again, he's still speaking to the Corinthian church. It's quite a long epistle because there's a lot of problems going on in the church. You know it by now, a lot of carnality, a lot of divisions, a lot of misuse of spiritual gifts, and a lot of sexual immorality going on and idolatry. It was just a wacky church that was going on. So last week, Paul began this discussion about the resurrection because the church had some pretty faulty views of the resurrection. So this week, he's going to continue to talk about the resurrection. He's going to set the record straight. He's going to show them that Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead. And you have to believe it or else it has very important ramifications for your life and your faith. So that is exactly what he talks about in today's passage. So this passage is going to show us that the resurrection of Jesus is an indispensable part of the gospel message as seen through these three important discussions he's going to present to us. So the first discussion shows us that the truth of the resurrection through the implications of the resurrection. That's in verses 12 to 19. The implications of the resurrections. Why is the resurrection important for my life? What does it mean whether it really happened or not? So let's look at it together. Verses 12 to 19. So now Paul continues from last week and says this. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. It says, your faith also is vain. Whoa, wow, he really cut to the chase right there. You see, there were some people in the church, of course, they believed in the resurrection, but then, you know, there were some that actually didn't really believe it happened. They said, oh, Jesus, he just rose spiritually, but he didn't actually resurrect physically. So Paul was saying, that's not true. You can't believe that because if you do, you are a heretic. The resurrection is a very important part of your Christian life that you need to believe in as a Christian because it has major consequences. So he was saying, if Jesus Christ has not been resurrected, why do you believe you will be resurrected? You see, if there is no future resurrection of all of us, then there's good reason to believe that Jesus himself didn't resurrect. And you know what? If Jesus himself didn't resurrect, that means everything that we're teaching in church, everything you believe is all in vain. You know what that means? That means it's all meaningless. Because how do we know if Jesus Christ really was telling the truth? I mean, he said a lot of great things, but if he didn't resurrect, for all we know, he could have just been another human teacher. A good teacher, but he wasn't God at all. That's what he was trying to say. Everything that we do in the Christian faith, us doing church together, doing evangelism, going on missions overseas, and dying overseas for our faith, all of that would be totally meaningless. That's the point he was trying to get here. But then he gets even more dangerous than that. In verse 15, he says, Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Ooh, so he is basically saying that if Jesus has not been raised, then you know what? We apostles were false teachers. We've been going around and just spreading a lie the whole time. In fact, even Jesus was a false teacher. That's why it is just so important that we believe in this. The resurrection is everything. So in verse 16, he continues and says this, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Oh, man. See, that is so important right there. Because we all know we need a Savior. Because all the way back in the Old Testament, they knew they needed a Savior. Because when we look at the Ten Commandments, for example, we know we've broken them, right? 
You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. <gasps> Whoa, we broke all those commandments because even Jesus said if we look at a person with lust and hate them, we've already broken those commandments. We broke them. And Jesus says if you break the commandments, you need to be punished. And that's why there's an eternal hell waiting when we die. That's everybody in the world who's going to escape God's judgment. That's why we all need a Savior. Thankfully, Isaiah tells us that a Savior is coming. Jesus Christ who came, that perfect Messiah who came righteous, sinless, and then died on the cross to take all of our sins away, taking the wrath of God upon ourselves, upon himself. But then, I have to ask you, what, okay, what if Jesus never rose from the dead then? What if he got crucified, he died, and he just kind of remained over there in his tomb to this day? Do you know what that means? That means that there's no forgiveness of sins. Simple as that. It really is that simple because, you know, Jesus' resurrection is basically God's proof to the entire world that his sacrifice actually worked. That's why the disciples, you know when Jesus died, they didn't go around just preaching the gospel immediately like they did in the book of Acts. They were just so sad that they just went back to their normal lives. But when he resurrected, whoa, that's when they were convinced and they started to go out and to preach the gospel to everybody. That's why it is so important. Because if Christ didn't resurrect, that means that God rejected Jesus Christ and that he was just a false teacher. Because God is not going to raise somebody up who's a false teacher, especially teaching everything that Jesus did. It was basically God's sign that this man is my spokesman. Remember, that's why I read to you earlier in Romans chapter 6, verses 8 to 9. He says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. You see? Even in verse 18, it says, Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. Which means that everybody up to the Apostles' time, beginning with Adam, all the way to the Apostles' time, if there is no resurrection, then all of them have pretty much ended up in hell. I know Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament. There was no, like, quote-unquote, you know, gospel that there is right now. But you know what? The Old Testament saints, those ones who are truly righteous, they believed in God and in His promises. And that is why God saved them. You see, when we believe in Jesus, God is taking Jesus' life. He's crediting that righteousness to us. But then he also credits that same righteousness to the Old Testament saints so that they can get into heaven by their faith. It all depends on the resurrection. I'm going to make it a little more clear to you. I don't know if you guys ever go to banks, but I go all the time because I need a deposit checks and cash. I'm not saying I'm a rich guy, but you know, of course, we just do that as adults. I rarely go into the cashier inside and to just to give them the money. I always go through the ATM machine. So far, I've not had a problem, but I always thought, what if this machine malfunctions? Like I feed it the checks and the, the cash, but then it, it doesn't reflect on my bank account statement, meaning it got lost. I mean, it could happen, but you know, one of the things that you can do is to ask for a receipt. Have them print it out for you so that in case there's anything that's wrong, you can always just show that receipt to somebody in the bank so that they can fix the problem. In the same way, Jesus Christ's resurrection is like God's receipt to us, showing that the sacrifice worked and that when you believe in him, that righteousness has been credited to your account and you are all good to go. That is why the resurrection is so important and the reason why we can go and confidently tell it to non-Christians out there so that they can be saved as well. Because really in verse 19, he tells us this once again to hammer it home. He says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So basically he's saying, if there is no resurrection, then we're pitiful people. Because Jesus Christ was just another teacher and that's it. Christianity is not pretty much valid. It's just another self-help, moralistic, 
mystical religion. That's it. So the point behind point number one is this. All of our preaching, all of our teaching, persecution, everything that you suffer as a Christian, all of it would be meaningless if the resurrection is not true. So basically, of the resurrection, he's going to show us in his plan how this is all going to unfold, basically. Not all at once, but in a certain pattern. So that's verses 20 to 28. He continues and says this, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. You know, back in the Old Testament times, the Israelites would go to the priest and they would offer up what's called the first fruits, which is pretty much the first of their crops. And it was an act of worship, kind of like when we give on Sundays, indicating their trust in the Lord God to provide. And do you know Jesus Christ? This analogy is so cool because Jesus is the first fruits of what is to come. So basically, he himself is like the prototype of everything that's coming in the future. When, you know, when he walked around during those 40 days after he resurrected, did you know that that's actually the same body that we're going to have in the future as well? I don't know if you guys have ever been to conventions or to those events where they display new car models, new, let's say like iPhones. Isn't that such an amazing feeling when you go inside and you're like, wow, I'm one of the first people to see this new car model. I'm one of the first people to see this new iPhone. I'm one of the first people to see this new product. Wow, this is gonna revolutionize the whole industry. Have you guys ever been to those things before? Okay, I have, I thought they were pretty cool. <laughs> but you know, the same thing is true because all of those things that you see in the conventions, they're the prototype. It basically showing this is what it's gonna look like when this comes out in like six months or something like that. So in the same way, Jesus' resurrection body is the prototype of what's to come with all of us in the future. Did you know that? So one day in God's timing, all of it is going to come up at the same time. Oh, praise God. Oh man, I'm getting so excited thinking about this. So he tells us here, basically, why we need to believe in Jesus. It's so important. In 21, he says, For since by a man came death, but by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. I think some of you guys remember this discussion from Romans, right? Like how in Adam there's death because we are born as a son or as a daughter of Adam. So by default, we're born as sinners and we're going to go into the grave and there's, what, nothing you can do about it? But you know, Jesus said, I'm going to do something about it. Because Adam represents death, but Jesus says, I'm the second Adam. I'm going to come in and do what Adam should have done. I'm going to be the perfect Adam, and I'm going to bring you righteousness and life. Wow. You see, once again, I've been telling you, when we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our sins, it's credited to Jesus. That's why he was punished so badly on that cross, because it was God's anger being taken out on Jesus that should have been put on us. It was God just pouring all of his wrath on Jesus that we should have gone for all eternity in hell. But you know what? Something cool also happens because he says that when our sins go to Jesus, his perfect life, his righteousness is credited to us so that as God is, you know, pouring out all his wrath on Jesus, he looks at us and he pours out all of his favor on us because he looks at us as if we had lived Jesus's perfect, beautiful life. Now you see why faith is so important because faith is what makes us righteous. He gives us that righteousness. It's not something we can work for. He gives it to us as a gift, but we need to trust in it. So that's why in Jesus we have life. That is so amazing. You see, I talked about this. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Do you guys remember this from a few months ago? He says, As through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Yes, Jesus is saying, you have a beautiful thing waiting for you. The resurrection, it is coming. In fact, in verse 23, he says this, But each in his own order, 
Christ the first fruits, but then after that, those who are Christ at his coming. Uh oh, wow, wow, that is so interesting right there. Jesus is saying, Jesus is the first fruits, meaning that he's the prototype. He's displaying himself to believers to see what you guys will expect in the future. But you're probably asking, but Jesus, it's been like 2,000 years already. Where is my body? You know what? God says that in his timing, it's like a harvest. You know how the harvest sometimes it just kind of stays as it is, but one day it just all blossoms and it is so beautiful, right? Jesus is telling us because he tells us in various parts of the passage that when he returns, called the rapture of the church, boom, that's when it all happens. The dead as well as the living, boom, all the believers when they go to be with him at Jesus. But then, of course, when he returns at his second coming, the Old Testament saints, tribulation, martyrs, those who have died at that time, they're all going to be raised with their glorified body as well. But then Jesus is going to do even more than that because he has some great plans for the future. According to verse 24 to 27, he says this, Then comes the end when Jesus hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, whom he has when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when, he, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evidence that he expected who put all things in subjection to him. Okay, I'm going to explain what this means. So basically, when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to do, uh, like I said, what Adam should have done originally. He's going to come, he's going to save us, he's going to rule, and he's going to exercise his dominion over the world. And then at the end, he's going to pretty much, you know, put the guilty, put them down, all the sinners who have made life a living hell, basically. And basically, they're all going to be judged. And then he's going to restore the entire world back to its original condition. No more sin, nothing like that. And then when that happens, we will pretty much be with him forever and ever in heaven. So... Guys, you know, we're all part of a very big story. So don't think that Jesus's work is just about giving us a ticket to heaven and that's it. Because it shows here it's part of a very big picture. Because we, sh we see here how he's going to come. He's going to pretty much abolish all sin. He's going to restore this world. I mean, we're all part of that future kingdom plan. So the lesson behind point number two is, is this. If there is no resurrection, then there is no future kingdom as well. Because really, who is Jesus going to rule over if there's nobody in this kingdom? That is why even the future kingdom of Jesus is really dependent on whether he resurrected or not. So that's why I want you to think about your lives and ask yourself, is this your hope? Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Christ. Because if you do, great. Because I know it's going to do wonders for your life. But if you don't believe in the resurrection, maybe that's the reason why you're not taking your faith seriously. And that's exactly what he tells us in the third and last point today, the effects of the resurrection. What kind of effect does it have on your life, whether you believe it or not? So that we see that in verses 29 to 34. For Paul continues and now says this, Otherwise, what will, those who, what, will the, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the, be, if the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? I admit this is kind of a difficult verse because some people have taken it, such as the Mormons. And they would say it's possible to be baptized on behalf of those who have died for their salvation. No, that's not true. Once they've died, their faith is pretty much sealed. We cannot be baptized to save, save anyone who's dead. So basically, most likely what this is meaning is that there are people who are brought into the faith because of the example of those who have died, basically, their testimony. So basically, Paul was saying, what use is it for you to get baptized if Christianity is not true? Really, that's what he's saying. 
Even in verse 30 to 31, he hammers it again and says, why are we also in danger every hour? I mean, I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So Paul was saying, if there is no resurrection, then why am I suffering all this as a Christian? Why am I going out preaching the gospel? I've lost my family. I've lost my friends. All my Jewish Orthodox friends have turned on me. I've gotten stoned. And, you know, I was part of this and I was part of that. He says, why do I have to suffer all of this stuff if the resurrection is not true? Because it's all for nothing. See, the resurrection gave him new life. It gave him the reason for doing evangelism and telling people about Jesus. You know, what Paul is saying is right, because if Christianity was not true, if Jesus didn't resurrect, then why am I living this kind of a life? I could just live like an atheist because they don't believe in God. They don't believe anything's going to happen when they die. So they just say, let's just live the best life we can right now, even if we do wrong, even if we have to lie and cheat and steal to get there. Let's do it because we only have 80 years to live, so let's do it. You know, that's what a lot of atheists actually believe. You know, there was a Greek historian who told of this ancient custom of the Egyptians back in their day. In the social meetings amongst the rich people who dined in a banquet, there was a servant who would carry around a coffin to display to all the guests and had like the picture, a wooden image of a corpse on this coffin, which resembled a dead person. So the servant would show it to all the guests and say, Gaze here and drink and be merry, for when you die, such you shall be. Wow, that's a great motivating factor. But you know what? If you think about it, that's actually a great idea if there was no such thing as God or Jesus' resurrection. In fact, that's what Paul even says here. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If there is no forgiveness or no resurrection, it means we can just live any single life we want. It doesn't matter. We can go out, we can cheat, we can fornicate, we can party, we can get rich and stomp on other people. It doesn't matter because when you're dead, you're in the grave and that's pretty much it. So live it up. But you know what? Christians don't think that way because if they understand that there's a way big eternity ahead, they're going to invest in this life in order to make their eternity a lot better. So Jesus is saying, if the resurrection is true, everything you do in this life is not wasted. It has meaning, so don't give up. That's why in Romans chapter 2, verse 7, he says this, To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. The hope of the resurrection is supposed to cause us to do good all the time. I don't know about you guys, but do you believe in the resurrection? And if you do, how does that shape the way you live your life? Because it seems like with these people, they were getting some wacky ideas about the resurrection and it really damaged their life. Because in verse 33, Paul says this, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You see, if you have a false view of the resurrection or any important doctrines of Christianity, it's going to corrupt you. You're going to live a sinful lifestyle. And that's exactly what was going on here. I'm not afraid to say it. Bad theology leads to a corrupt lifestyle. That is why it's so important that you really believe in the right thing. And you're hanging around with people who will encourage you in the faith and not hanging around people who are going to mislead you into false theology, mislead you into a bad lifestyle. So you really have to be careful who you hang around with too. Are you there to just, you know, are, of course we should be there to evangelize them, but sometimes we're, we're not doing that. We're there because we want to live their lifestyle as well. Paul is saying, be careful of that. Now here's his whole takeaway point in verse 34. This is really the, what he, where he's trying to get at. He says this, Become sober-minded as you ought, and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. See, this is the reason why he gave us this whole discussion of the resurrection. So you probably are asking, okay, so what's your point, Paul? Why are you talking about the resurrection so much? It's this. 
If you really believe in the resurrection, it's going to hold you accountable. Then you're going to live in fear of God and really obey God. But if you don't believe in the resurrection and no afterlife, you're just going to do whatever you want in life. That's what he's saying here. So he's telling us these things so that we can take our faith seriously and stop sinning. So a belief in the resurrection is supposed to strengthen our holy life, strengthen our righteous living. Because really, if you don't believe in the resurrection, maybe that's the reason why you don't take, you know, your righteous living seriously. You, you live just like your unbelieving friends because you don't really believe in it. So, you know, in summation, once again, this passage tells us the implication, the sequence, and the effect of the resurrection to show us that it's true. It's true, and it is so important for the gospel, and you need to believe in it in order to be saved, and you need to defend it at all costs, even if enemies come and try to dissuade you from it. So I want to throw out a challenge for you. If you're here today, you claim to be a Christian, but then in your mind you're like, I don't know. I don't know if the resurrection really happened. In fact, I don't even know if all of the things in the Bible really happened, to tell you the truth. My friends don't believe in it, so maybe it's not true. Well, Paul is saying, if you believe that, then you have no eternal life. Because everything in the Bible, it is true. It happened. It can be proved archaeologically, scientifically, prophetically. It can be. I can even sit here for days and show you all these slideshows and presentations. And maybe we can even take a trip to Israel as well and I can show you all this stuff. But you know what? That's not going to convince you of the truth. Because sin is the reason why we don't believe in Jesus. Because we love sin so much that we'd rather have that than to have Jesus. Today, I want to implore you, get rid of that sin. Lift it up to God and say, God, I want to abandon my sin. And I want your gift to be given to me, which is eternal life. Please do that. You know, I'm, I, I'm telling you, please do that. Because we don't know how much longer we're going to live. So we got to get right. Because what about this? What if Jesus says tomorrow, tomorrow is the day of the harvest of all the resurrected souls? You know what that means? That means Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take believers. But then those who haven't really truly believed, they're just going to get left behind. That's scary. So he says, get right. Because if tomorrow is the harvest day for believers, it's going to be the greatest day ever. But for unbelievers, it's really going to be the most terrifying day. So... So really get right today. But then I also want to say this. If you are a Christian here today, I hope you can always think of the resurrection as the reason why you do good, why you reach out to unbelievers. Because sometimes it may seem like a waste of time, but remember, if the resurrection is true, that means everything you do has meaning before God, and God is going to remember it. He's going to reward you for it. So definitely... Stick to the resurrection and fight for it if you need to, because the world is at stake with this important doctrine. So with this being said, I want us to pray and to think about this very indispensable part of the gospel message. Think about what you believe in this area. Think about whether you really do believe in the resurrection, just like we celebrate on Easter so many times. And if you do believe in it, what impact is it having in your life? Does it shape the way you make your decisions in your life? Does it help you to persevere in very tough times and in temptation? Heavenly Father, we know that we are imperfect we are sinners in need of a Savior. And we are so thankful that you have given us hope because of the resurrection, which shows us that Jesus' sacrifice really did work on the cross and that we can trust in you for salvation. So let us never lose hope of that because without this resurrection, we will have no motivation for everything that we do in life. For even if people make fun of us, even if we lose opportunities, even if we are martyred for our faith, we can still rejoice because of the resurrection. 
So let us celebrate that, Lord. Let us really think about that every single day so that we can live a Christ, victorious Christian life. So Lord God, we ask for your forgiveness if we have not been strong enough, but let this be the day, just like the apostles when they saw the resurrected Christ, that we can have a new joy and new motivation to live sold out for the glory of God. And all this we lift up in Jesus' name. Amen.